Date point. Seventh month. Third week. Fourth day. BV. Dear journal. I swear I'm not crazy. You'd tell me if I was, right? I stood in shock, transfixed by the thing in front of me. It continued to stare at me impassively, with a slightly smug tilt to his features. I stepped closer in the suddenly cramped cockpit, looking for any imperfections in the fast smile. Great hair, great smile, flawless jawline if I do say so myself. Narcissistically obsessing over me is exactly the same as doing it in the mirror, you realise. Once again, his mouth moved in echo of the lies I heard in my head. Oh, come now. You're not this daft. I'm being thorough. Shut up while I do my thing. One last check. You don't mind, right? He shrugged. Go ahead. I swiped my fusion blade for his neck. Nothing. Not even the token resistance flesh offered when introduced to the business end of a fusion blade. It officially wasn't there. Happy? Not really. And must you continue with this it business is dehumanizing. You're not human, so you can't be dehumanized. Your eyes and I beg to differ. Stop saying that. Saying what? I. Yes. It makes you uncomfortable? You know it does. It. He smiled. I know. Why though? I've been using I for a while now. Because then you weren't a full-blown hallucination with a moving mouth and sitting right in front of me as I hear your voice. Back then you were... I don't know, private? Now you're... Real? Yeah. You've been talking to a voice in your head for months. Seeing things is the next logical step. But why? Why was I even hearing things in the first place, let alone why do they morph into me now seeing things as well? Beats me. You'd probably be worth several psychological studies, though. Don't let it go to your head. How can you have no idea how you exist? Because you don't. I only know what you do, after all. I'm just the best version of what you know. A perfect representation of what you would look and act like if you ever took the time to think things through, rather than just emoting through life. Does this mean I'm crazy? Well, it certainly doesn't help that you're talking out loud right now. I'm not- Oh, shit. But the question remains. Does this mean I'm crazy? Without a doubt. Have been for some time. Doesn't mean you're not still sane, though. Yes, it quite definitely does. I mean, sure, definition-wise it does, but reality is so much more complex than that. People can be mostly crazy and still have a little sanity left in them. The real question you should be asking yourself is how much crazy do you have in you, and then use that to figure out how much sanity you have left. Okay, so how much sanity is still in there? Fuck if I know. Great, lovely, alright then. Assuming I still have enough to function, what's the next step? It raised an eyebrow in question. Next step? What next step? The one that has to be there. I've just gone from only hearing things to now seeing them too. So, what's next? Like I said at the onset of this discussion, you have a hunch as to what happened to Eli's original ship. We could check that once we're done dropping him off. That's it? Business as usual? You have a better idea? Don't bother answering because I know for a fact you don't. Well, if you know what I'm thinking even before I think it, why are we even conversing? Don't you know what I'm going to say before I say it? Sure, but that'd be impolite. I'm pretty sure it's impolite to force a guy to question his own sanity. Which is why I not only asked it, but I answered the question for you. You're batshit. I flipped him off. Are we insulting the ship today? I spun. Iava stood in the doorway, looking at me curiously as I continued to aim my feelings at the spectre sitting before me. She couldn't see it. All she saw was me giving the bird to navigation. Again with the it? I ignored it. I like to insult the ship for a few minutes every day. Gotta make sure it knows where it stands in the order of things, lower its self-esteem. If the machines are too busy suffering from emotional damage, then Skynet will be too busy trying to gain our acceptance for it to take over anything. Is it important for me to know what Skynet is? Probably, but I'm not going to take the time to explain. If I ever get a chance to get some movies, I'll show you. She looked at me through bored eyes, her mouth in a tight line. And movie- You know what? I don't care. You show it to me one day if it's important. That's a gorgeous line of reasoning. Hold on to that. It'll be important the next time you're with me. I've gathered, she sighed. How long before eli has gone? I don't want to be near him any longer than necessary. That bad, huh? Few days, but I got something to do immediately after if you're up for it. She hopped for me to continue. Something's been stopping ships and killing off the crew a day or so from here. 
After we drop the raccoon off, what do you say to checking it out? She perked up, eyes narrowing. Wait, some unknown entity's been killing people and you want to go looking for it. Why? Sounds fun, I shrugged. That, and I think there's a chance it might be an old acquaintance of mine. If it is, it may be partially my fault. She returned to her previously scheduled look of resigned disappointment. Yeah, that sounds about right. It being your fault, not necessarily the acquaintance part. I hit her with the double finger guns and a wink. Up for a game? She changed subjects. I don't feel like being alone right now. Normally I would have thought she was just trying to guilt trip me into a game, but I could tell something was on her mind. Oh, really? I wonder what? Not a clue. Hopefully she doesn't want to talk about it. The apparition stared at me in disgust. We set up in the living dining area since Relai has retired to engineering. I'd offered to let him sleep the much more comfortable furniture in here, since they were only two bedrooms and I wasn't about to sleep on the couch. He'd wanted privacy though, so he had opted for the back of the ship. It worked out well now, since there really wasn't enough room for two people and a ghost to play a game in the cockpit. As we set up the board, it sat down to my left. Now you're just being mean. Something was eating at her. Halfway through, I was able to catch her in a trap that even I wouldn't have fallen for. Most telling of all, she barely seemed to care. Just a few turns away from what was about to be my first victory since the day I'd taught her, she extended her tower to move a bishop, but stopped mid-motion. Eyes glazed in thought. Should I stop trying? She spoke suddenly, tower still poised. Shit. I looked off on the board. In this game, might as well, not much you can do at this point. Ignoring my answer, she took a deep breath. Because every time I try to do the right thing, I just fuck it up. Joining the temple guards, the attempted coup, and now this. Every time I think I've made the right choices, subsequent events just go on to prove that I've done more harm than good. If things just end up worse off after I try to help, what's the point? I'm not saying I should do the opposite and actively try to ruin things, but should I just stop trying to help at all? I remained silent, hoping the questions were far more for herself than me. She continued to look at me expectantly, waiting for an answer. Fine, I'm not the best person to ask here, you of all people should know that, I began. But if you want my flawed opinion, then I'd say stop beating yourself up over the things you can't control. Sure, the things you did might have gotten people killed, and probably even fucked things up more than they already were, but did you want that to happen? Of course not. Did you make the best decisions, at the time, based on all that you knew? I think, but then that's it, you did your best. You might fail every single time you try to help. I have so far. Failing is the only thing I've had success at since I've been out here. Since high school, really. But I'm still going to try and make things right. I'm going to fuck that up, too. I'm going to keep fucking up until one of my mistakes finally kills me. But until that happens, I'll make the best decisions I can based off what I know at the time. And if that decision is to step back and let someone else take the reins, you better believe I'll hop out of the driver's seat. But until then, I'm the only one there, so I might as well try and steer. I shrugged. My take on it, at least. That didn't really make me feel any better. Yeah, me neither. You ever find anything that does, be sure to give me some. She sighed. Deal. Her tail flicked forward and snatched a piece. Checkmate. Fuck. Date point. Seventh month. Second week. BV. Planet. Perfection. The Contact. Of course I wasn't involved. If I had, then it wouldn't have failed so spectacularly. Don't interrupt me with baseless accusations again. I can simulate a conversation with you far faster using a nerve jam. Vagno cut the channel, then busied herself with ensuring her tracks were covered. Far too little time passed before another call broke her concentration. She perked the moment she saw who it was, quickly letting it through. The human scowling face greeted her. She had to admit, it had taken him longer to get back to her than she thought. He seemed to have missed nearly every net she'd cast at him on Hedonist. Still, he was here, so one of them had to have worked. She didn't even bother entertaining the possibility that he was just following her previous orders to contact her after the previous job. You look exceptionally well for someone who swore they'd spaced themselves before contacting me. The pleasure to what do I owe it? His face betrayed a cocktail of emotions, resignation foremost among them. I need the location of a human. He was the cause of a severe travel advisory on route 3861-6261-77039, but we just checked it and the only thing that's there are a shit ton of abandoned vessels. Vakno made a quick mental note to get someone out there as soon as possible. 
As far as I can tell, he was here about a month ago or so. That's the last recorded ship going missing here. I need to know where he went, and I have no idea where to look. He's kind of murdery, if you need something to help you find him. I'll manage, she replied. Humans are extremely easy to find if you know what to look for. Might I ask, what put you on this particular specimen's trail? A couple of Gowian slaves broke him out, and they told me about the area and what happened to their old ship when they went by. She didn't hear him pass the word slaves. The Gowians having what did the trick. Layer after layer of traps meant to bring him back into her services, and the one that caught him was something she hadn't even engineered, nor even given much thought. If he somehow wasn't going to fall for something she did, then he could have at least had the decency to have not fallen at all. The results, however, could not be argued with, so she decided to allow events to continue to transpire, and merely add this to the list of reasons why she hated him. Very well, I should hope that you understand what my doing this for you means. The grinding of his teeth was audible. Yes, a favour? Free, she corrected. Free? That wasn't how that worked last time. It was a little while ago, but I could have sworn it was... One, because I had no money, another because I insulted you or something, and the last one because of... Um, fuck if I know. Well, she smiled thinly, your tone is always insulting, so we can easily tack on a second, and if you require a reason for the third, then how about the fact that you failed to mention how you currently have another death or species on your ship? He was truly terrible at keeping his emotion off his face. At the mention of his companion, his eyes bulged before he hastily tried to cover up the fact that they had. What? I... She cut him off with a sharp gesture. As amusing as it would be to watch you try to lie to me, of all people, I don't have the time. I'm angry, of course, but that is always the case with you. All that matters is that you know that you can't hide anything from me. So next time, just make it painless for the both of us and tell me. She squared her shoulders to signal the matter was settled. Therefore, as I see it, the price remains at free favours. Correct me if I'm wrong. She glared to ensure that he, in fact, should not correct her under any circumstances. But I assume that if there was anyone else you could go to, you would have. So in a way, you should be grateful that I set the price at such a low number when, in fact, I could set it at whatever I desired. His look of resignation was almost worth every headache he'd ever caused her. I'm fine. Send me the information when you have it. It's already being sent. You're kidding, he said in a strange mixture of disgust and admiration. I'm very good at what I do, and like I said, humans leave very distinct trails. You have two weeks to do whatever it is you needed this for, and they will contact you with your first task. She cut the channel as he opened his mouth, the petty action giving her a small thrill of satisfaction. Bitch. Way to stick it to the man, or woman in this case. You sure showed her. You're a bitch too. It rolled his eyes. Unaware of my inner dialogue, Yava slid around the doorframe behind which she'd been listening. So, I guess that's it for secrecy, so I can come along on this trip? I shrugged. No reason why not. You did fine on the last trip, aside from the whole getting accidentally abducted by slavers part. Might draw a few stares since you're the only one of your kind out here. You hope. But who gives a fuck what they think? I thought a moment. Actually, unfuck what they think for a second and first make sure what they're thinking isn't I'm scared for my life. If it's not that, then yeah, fuck him. She opened her mouth, paused, closed it, opened it again, blinked a couple of times, then sighed. There were much easier ways of putting that. You're not wrong, I agreed. So our destination is? I opened the data package Vagnos sent. Some planet, class 4. I tell you the name, but there aren't any vowels. I'm partial to those when speaking. Her affected air of calm wasn't nearly good enough to conceal her excitement. I haven't been to an inhabited planet since I got out here. Anything I need to know? I thought about it a moment. Not off the top of my head, but I'm not exactly the best forward thinker. How about we go there, wait until it all goes to shit, and then after that I'll give you some pointers. Good old reliable then. Excellent. Date point. Seventh month, first week, BV. Book of <laughs> Class 4 World. Planets suck. Or rather, heavily inhabited planets suck. Shit, I don't even know if this planet could qualify as even lightly inhabited, but from where I was standing right now, it was inhabited as fuck. Vagano's information had led us to the largest city on the largest continent. The primary inhabitants seemed to be a third quadruped with long tails. 
As per the atonomical motif out here, their legs looked far too thin to support them, and the way they moved. It looked relaxed, sure, but it reminded me of a stilt walker. Looking beyond their legs, their bodies were small and vaguely pyramidal, with a small hump in the middle, although that might have just had to do with their posture. Past the hump, the rest of their bodies spread wide, then tapering down to one of their four legs. Their hairs were vaguely reptilian in shape, but their hair was far too long and shaggy. This going anywhere? Give me time, a good name takes a minute. Frumpley Steelskin. Boom. That's just terrible. Then you should have come up with something better. I guess the city was pretty enough. It had some pretty cool shit that I bet would have been impossible in heavier gravity. I don't know, I just hadn't walked amongst the main populace of a city for what seemed like forever, so it's no real surprise that I was uncomfortable. That, and I decided to get into my disguise, as it were. Remembering what Vagano had said about humans not being quite such an unknown anymore, I figured that if my hunch was correct and P2 was here, I didn't want to risk alerting him to my presence. My disguise wasn't meant to make me look like anything, but rather make it so underneath all the layers I could be anything that was on the shorter side of things. The main takeaway from all of this is that I was sweltering under my admittedly self-imposed torture. Trying to distract myself from the small river cascading down my back, I decided to take the time to actually look around me. Wait, you can do that? Look and worry about something other than yourself? You never told me you were so talented. It was loud and hot. Fuck, I wanted to go home. Fuck planets. Ialva. Fuck yes, planets. If Sylvan hadn't expressly told her that she needed to stay close until they knew more about the situation, she would have searched ahead, determined to see every sight and hear every sound. A great multitude swirled around her. It was incredible. The sheer number of people that this city held. If she hadn't been so small compared to nearly all of them, she would have worried about being crushed. Even though they were easy to manoeuvre around, their voices were not. Waves upon waves of garbled sound crashed into her, bearing on it the sounds of productivity, purpose, anger and laughter. Fantastical structures of glass and some whitish metal rose above, twisting and turning in ways she hadn't known were even possible into a sky crowded with hundreds of ships, each unique in their own way. The only thing dampening her mood was the thing that had told her to stay close to it. Selvim, bundled in so many layers he looked more like a pillar of cloth that one day decided to start moving on its own, trundled behind her. From deep within the bundle's depths, she heard Selvin's mumbled curses as he slowly navigated through the throng, slightly ruining the desired effect of the disguise by the way he didn't even twitch when one of the many creatures accidentally bumped into him. An even slightly observant watcher would have noticed how the seemingly diminutive figure had a mass far greater than one would expect as it made a small wake through the crowd, parting it by virtue of simply plying through it at a torturous pace. Maybe she didn't look at him, she'd be able to enjoy the experience. This is pointless, I shouted, the moment I pried the stifling headpiece off in the safety of the ship. Dry sweat had congealed the multi-layer covering into a helmet, maintaining its shape as I threw it across the room to strike the opposite wall. The other climbed in behind me, mouth in a tight line. We won't find anything just wandering around in the crowd, I continued. We need to find a way to actually find the guy, not just wander around and hope we bump into him. Wait, that was your plan? She asked incredulously. I thought we were just sightseeing or getting our bearings or something. You actually thought you'd get something like that? I don't know, I snapped. This guy isn't really subtle. I was hoping maybe there'd be like a quarantine area or something that people were warned not to go because there was some kind of monster. Apparently he's managed to not draw attention to himself somehow. Either that or he's not the guy I thought he was. How about you start from there? Who do you think this guy is? Give me the short version. I sighed. A long time ago, before I became Selvim, I met another human out here. At first, I was super stoked because he was the first human I'd seen in what felt like years, except after talking with the guy, it was easy to tell he was a batshit crazy, like the murdery kind. He killed a bunch of merchants and traders and stuff. I fought him, he kicked my ass, then another guy showed up and shit went downhill real fast from there. Point being, he got away because I put him in reach of his shuttle, so this is kind of my fault if this is him. And I'm almost positive it is, because all those dead bodies we found on those ships down that trade route looked exactly like what he'd done before. Yeah, I was there, don't remind me. She'd come with me, and even I was a little repulsed by what we'd found. The bodies are being strewn about, viscera scattered like feathers from a bird, the walls liberally splattered with the multicoloured fluids of many different species. 
So assuming Fagner knows her stuff, and I hate to say it, but she really does, then he's here. I was expected to get here and find a bunch of dead bodies, but even he couldn't kill this many people, so he's got to be lying low. How do we find out where he's hiding? I waited expectantly. The silence dragged on until Yava finally poked up. Wait, you're seriously asking me? How should I know? I barely understand even a fraction of what's going on here. I get the gist, of course. People are just people regardless of how much magic they have. But when it comes down to particulars, I'm hopeless. So what you're saying is you're going to make me come up with ideas. What a terrifying proposition that must be for you. Thinking. Yava shrugged, allowing me to address the other conversation in the room. I decided to actually look at it for the first time since it had appeared. It lounged to the right of me on a couch in the living area, into which the airlock allowed entrance to the ship. So what would you do? You said you were with me if I took the time to think things through, so how about it? What does the self-proclaimed best version of me have to say about this situation? It rolled his eyes. Finally. It's simple. If he's hiding out somewhere, then he's smart enough to know that if he attempts to slaughter everyone in sight, he'll eventually be taken down. From your previous fight with him, it's clear he has a great self-preservation instinct. Remember he didn't say to fight the moment the odds were against him? So that means he has enough mental faculties to judge the situation and make strategic choices. Despite this, his main motivations still seem to be to kill as much as possible. So assuming he hasn't given up on that completely, then the best strategy for him to have against such a large population will be selective predation, with the criteria being level of isolation. Following that line of reasoning, you should be looking for missing persons cases. Initially to see if there has been an increase in incidents in the last month, and if so, then try to draw conclusions from the victims themselves or their last seen locations to find a pattern you could use to create an organised and efficient search mechanism. How you're going to get the most recent missing person cases, I have no idea, Nick shrugged. Maybe try law enforcement? What the fuck was that? Did you think I was being vain when I said I was better than you? Okay, I wouldn't go that far, so you're better at reasoning, which doesn't make sense. It would if you were better at reasoning. But even on my best day, I've never come up with a plan like that. I tend to just kind of blunder around until something works, or nothing's left working. Being self-aware of that fact doesn't make it any better. So I'll repeat, where the fuck did that come from? It smiled. I've already told you. I'm you if you took the time to think things through. If you're not going to listen to the voice in your head, who do you listen to? Anything but. Alright, how about this? Yalba perked up as I broke the silence. He hasn't been found yet, right? Otherwise Wagner's information would have sent us to a prison or a morgue, so he's laying low. I doubt he stopped killing though, since that's how he got his kicks. So maybe we should check missing persons cases. Makes sense, she hopped in agreement. So where do we find those? No clue, maybe law enforcement post them publicly? A cursory search on the local data network showed that to not be the case. Fuck, I sighed. We're going to have to go outside again, won't we? Probably. Her eyes narrowed. What do you have in mind? Something dumb that will almost certainly fail. You absolute madman. One block away from... <laughs> City Central Precinct. So, I know I've said this multiple times already. Iava squeaked when hopping beside me. But I feel like it bears repeating again. This isn't going to work. Not with that attitude. Look, what's the worst that could happen? Everything. The spectre's mouth was drawn in a grim smirk as he faced through the crowd on my other side. Well, this is the only idea we have so far. I aimed a mental elbow dick at the hallucination. If it works, then we get everything we need and more. If it doesn't, then we're back to square one. Iava huffed. With the entire police force at our heels, Maybe if we prepared a little bit, this could work, but you just looked up the name of some agency and then said, let's go. What are they going to do? Shoot us with their piss pistols? We can get away if things turn ugly. You said no one was going to get hurt. They won't. We can run faster than them. Stop worrying, you'll give yourself an ulcer. I'll give you an ulcer. Whatever that is, she muttered. The doors opened before us as we walked in. The building blessedly air-conditioned. Showtime. I'll watch from over here, he said, leaning against the wall next to the door. Exuding as much confidence as was possible while wearing what felt like an entire circus tent's worth of fabric on my body, I showed up to the front desk where a blue giraffe with a bored expression tapped on the screen. I couldn't have asked for a better receptionist. Luck was in the air, it was actually on my side. I hoped. Backup has arrived, 
I said with a booming voice. The poor soul jumped to my near shout, startled out of the catatonic hell that is a desk job. I... wait, what? He stuttered. What is it with blue giraffes and stuttering? Back up, I continued, in a slightly quieter but no less carrying voice. Your request for help from the Dominion Department of Interplanetary Justice has been answered. We? I gestured to Yalva and myself. I'm here to fix your... I lowered my voice to a conspiratorial whisper. Problem. Problem? What problem? I was not aware we sent a request to the DGIJ for... I had to keep him off balance, so I interrupted him. Son, if you don't know what I'm here for, then just tell me where to find your superiors and alert them I'm coming. I'm not... Kid, I cut him off. This is above your pay grade. Maybe it was best if I didn't leave the decision up to him. I started walking down a hall that led me deeper into the building. This way to ongoing investigations? Yes, but I'm still not... Thanks. Make sure they know we're on our way. I turned and walked quickly away, leaving him to stammer half on protest behind us. Stammering. They were bigger than that, too. He said they didn't have a problem. Yava hissed behind me as we strolled deeper into the station. This isn't going to work. We should leave while we still can. Not yet, I hissed back. They might not have told him. I know if I wanted to keep something secret, I wouldn't let a blue giraffe know. Not to be specious or anything. As we continued to walk... Yalva inhaled sharply several times as though she were about to voice more quitter talk. But if she'd learned anything by my body language right now, then she'd know by the confident figure I struck as I marched forward that nothing short of a wall would stop me now. Maybe not even that, considering how paper thin some structures were out here. She can't see your posture, dumbass, not in that get-up. Then she'd tell by the confident pose my amorphous lump of a figure struck as I marched forward. Semantics. Point being, I was going to keep going down this path until someone shot at me. You're mad. Say so yourself. Instead of criticism, you could give me some encouragement. Godspeed, you beautiful disaster, he said sarcastically, swinging his hand in an exaggerated salute. I'll take it. Reaching a door with a sign telling me I had arrived, I burst into the room, took a deep breath, then headed for the largest office in sight. I didn't make it more than three steps before a frumpy stiltskin got in my way, attempting to keep me from my glorious purpose. Hold up. Who are you and what are you doing? Having already planned for this, I gave Yava the signal. It was supposed to be a cool hand gesture with a lot of flashy finger movements and fist maneuvers, but from under the top of my disguise, it probably looked like I was enthusiastically jacking myself off. Whatever got the message across, and my faux jack evidently did, as Yava shot underneath the frumpy steel skin and with a towel in between his legs. He collapsed to the ground, sputtering, just in time for another one of his colleagues to take his place and attempt to waylay me. She too joined her friend on the ground, overcome by my presence and the fact that a kangaroo rat jerked her feet out from under her. By now all eyes were on us, and all minds set to stop me. And so it was that I arrived at the head honcho's office door, a frumpy steelskin Moses. The other parting fuckers like the Red Sea as I strode ahead. I gave her a thumbs up from which her perspective must have looked like the grand climax beneath my disguise, before I barged into the office I had guessed belonged to whoever was in charge. Once inside I placed myself before the door, which swung inwards, to keep it from being easily opened. What if Yalva needs to get in? I told her to just bounce around and not get caught until I was done. You're pointedly not looking at me, so I'll just tell you. I'm glaring at you disapprovingly. Noted. Turning, I looked at the white giraffe sitting against the far wall. Mouth agape and figure frozen in what I hoped was indicative of a fun-loving and understanding state of mind. Working off the assumption that it was precisely that, I said the first thing that came to me. There seems to be some kind of accident out there. and someone trips, you should probably look into it after we're through here. But first we need to talk. He continued to gape. Excellent. You're a man of action. My favourite. I'm here from the DDIJ in response to your call for help regarding your current carnivore problem. He finally found his words. What are you talking about? You come in here, attack the precinct, then attack me in my office and start spouting nonsense about some kind of carnivore problem. As the head of public relations, I can assure you that if there were a carnival problem, this precinct and his officers would... Let me stop you right there, I interrupted. Head of public relations, you're not the head of ongoing investigations? No, but if you're wondering who's in charge, then most definitely... Where's the other guy's office? There, he gestured at the wall beside me. There looked to be made of frosted glass, but... Oh, so sorry to bother you, another time perhaps. I turned and walked through the wall beside me. It was indeed frosted glass and shattered when I shoulder checked it. My burka protected me from the falling shafts as I strode to the considerably smaller, but far more cluttered desk with a composed frumpy steelskin behind it. Hello, I began again. I'm from... The DGIJ, I heard, she said calmly. 
And while I'm low to agree with him, she looked over my considerably padded shoulder at the white giraffe still sputtering behind me, on anything, I must agree that if there were any carnival problem in the city, then this precinct and its sisters would be capable to take care of it quickly and professionally. So how about you instead tell me why you're really here, and I can decide how long your incarceration will be. I smiled underneath my disguise. Fuck, it had been a while since I met anyone out here besides Wagner who could stand up for themselves. This was starting to get fun. How? Your flimsy lie hasn't even made it past your first sentence. So scrap the lie, I'll improvise. You need to learn to give up before the guns are aimed at your face. I'll level with you, I said, ignoring my critic. I'm not from the DGIJ. I'm shocked, she deadpanned. But you're wrong when you say you don't have a carnival problem. In fact, you have the most dangerous carnival of all. Time for the Hail Mary. I mean, if I was wrong about this, then there was no point in me being here anyway. Tell me, you've had an increase in missing persons cases over the past month, correct? Of course we haven't! The white giraffe's voice erupted from behind me. I would have jumped if I'd been able to under my layers. And if there were, then we'd be sure to- Richard, enough, interrupted the frumpy stillskin. This person is most obviously not a reporter, and it sounds like they already know. Go back to your desk and shuffle papers around to feel important, won't you? I won't forget this, grumbled the white giraffe, as he retreated to the other side of their now shared office. You never do, she muttered. Turning back to me, she continued. Yes, there has been a recent increase, but we worked hard to keep that fact from the public so as to avoid a panic. Thankfully, it hasn't gotten so bad that they've noticed. Now, my turn. How do you know about this, and what does it have to do with attacking my officers and destroying my favourite wall? The latter? I was interrupted by a furry body striking the frosted glass wall to my right. I looked to see Arva, as per my instructions, bounce around the precinct like a pinball from the terminal. To the untrained eye, it looked like chaos. Even as we watched an unfortunate officer die for her, slamming into the glass moments behind her. To the officer now on the ground, he may have thought he had been close, but to me, and especially to Iava, he was woefully slow. She had things under control. Ahem, <clears throat> as I was saying, the latter was simply because I needed to talk to you, not through someone else. This was the easiest way, considering my needs. As to how I know this, it's complicated. Simply put, I represent a Dominion agency that looks for particular warning signs, such as have been reported by this precinct in order to investigate and ensure that it's not a worst-case scenario. Unfortunately, upon reviewing your case, I'm afraid it is. You have a hunter. That made her shell crack. For a moment, I saw her outer calm disintegrate into animal fear before it was quickly brought under control and contained. Tough, this one. For a moment, she controlled her breathing. Mind expounding on that? What do you mean by, you have a hunter? Exactly that, I'm afraid. I continued in a businesslike manner. A hunter, I believe is just one in your case, has gone to ground somewhere in the city. That's why you've had an increase in atypical missing persons cases. That hunter is, well, hunting. Her face betrayed emotion for the second time this conversation, as it twisted incredulously. How are you sure? A long tradition in history of sniffing out and seeing cases like yours. I puffed up importantly, but no need to fear, my partner and I have a 100% success rate with these kind of problems, and yours won't be any different, I promise. Nice, it said, eyes rolling. Nothing will get in the way of you keeping that one. Hold on, she interrupted. How can this be? I never heard of hunters being on their own, nor have I heard of them going to ground. You're right, I assured her. It certainly isn't common, but if it weren't for the hard work of our department, it most definitely wouldn't be unheard of. For the same reason you haven't alerted the general populace to the increase in missing persons, we haven't made public the lesser known actions of hunters. Aside from general safety concerns, releasing such information would severely mess with our prediction algorithms. Everyone and their cousin would swear that their friend whom they haven't seen for a day was abducted by a hunter. Believe me, keeping people in the dark is the right decision. She momentarily glanced in the direction of my spectre. Could she see it? Apparently not, because her eyes drifted blindly over it. After a moment she sighed. If you're correct about our situation, then I'm glad you're here. If there's anything you need, don't hesitate to ask. Score. Thanks. I turned away from the desk. Well, I should go call off my partner now that we've had a chance to talk. You'll probably want to check on your officers and be sure that they're alright. No egos bruised or anything like that. They really did an excellent job trying to stop us. Exemplary. I walked to the door and opened it onto a scene straight out of the Free Stooges set. Half the precinct was on the ground trying desperately to disentangle themselves from their comrades, with whom they had collided in their attempt to catch the flying ball of fluff that was the Alva. Seemingly unconcerned with such simple things as gravity, she careened around the room, ricocheting off of walls and even the ceiling, as she remained so far from anyone's grasp that she might as well have been on a different planet. Catching a glimpse of her face as she paused for a moment to take a sip from an unguarded cup of water, I could tell she was having a blast. 
Upon seeing me, she lurched in my direction, stopping on a dime beside me. Seeing their target stop moving for the first time since she'd entered the mass of officers surged forward, only to be brought up short by a bark command from behind me. What's going on? Everyone get back to work, the situation has fixed itself. Trash, brrr, give our new friends here all that you have on the recent missing persons cases. Until they're done here, you're to assist them with anything they need. The rest of you? She made a general sweeping gesture at the crowd before us, and the general disarray of what had once been a well-organized precinct. Clean this mess up and get back to work. The crowd slowly dispersed. A low hum of mutterings and half-heard excuses drifting from no one in particular. A white giraffe and frumpy steelskin separated from the group and approached us. So, uh, I guess we're supposed to help you? The white giraffe offered, up lamely after several awkward seconds of silence. Sounds like it, I agreed, unless you're not the person she mentioned. I wasn't even about to try pronouncing the gull or conglomerations of letters they called names. We are, continued the white giraffe. I'm Trur, this is Brrr. He gestured to the figure beside him. The Sykes and George then stood, waiting, I assume, for our names. Pleasure. Down to business. Time is something we don't have. First and foremost, we need the last known locations of our missing persons, followed by any leads or clues you have regarding their current whereabouts, states of health, anything like that. And I'm going to need a city map. Sykes left. Presumably to do what I just asked, but honestly he could have been going to put on more than a utility harness as far as I knew. George led us to a desk, looking at us over his shoulder. It's probably just me, but I don't remember the captain introducing you. Who are you again? Someone that's here to help, and from the looks of things, you need it. He bristled. At least I think he did. Shocking. I wonder what could have possibly offended him. No clue. Touchy guy, George. Maybe he should have been named Sykes. Eh, too late. If we're going to be working with you, the least you could give us would be your names. I sighed. Any help? With? A name? I came up with the last one. You've come up with all of them. A status quo I have no problem maintaining. I do, though. If you're going to be taking up residence, then you need to own your keep somehow. I'll do literally anything. Wait, what am I saying? I don't have to earn rent. Damn it. Fine. Agent K. I think it's technically K. Oh, look who suddenly wants in. And my associate is Agent J. She's looking askance at you. Which is why I was ignoring her. Thank you for making me the bad guy. By informing me. She'll be fine. She'll roll with it. Agent. George cut into my inner dialogue. I nodded. From a small department in the DGIJ. George scoffed. So they're giving out the title of agent to just anyone in the DGIJ? Only those that deserve it. The Fromby still can open his mouth with an obstinate set to his features, presumably to continue his assault upon my assumed character, when Sykes finally returned with a chip. He looked at George's slightly irritated visage and my covered one, made a placating motion, then called up the data on the desk. Several interface interactions later, I was looking at what was obviously a city grid with clear markers placed upon it. I pointed to one. These are the places where we lost surveillance coverage of the targets? Sykes gave me a look. Surveillance? Why would we have surveillance on random city streets? Right, wouldn't want this to be too easy. Of course, silly question, so these data points are... Most are based upon the last time they were seen by witnesses. Some are predictions based on what the victim's usually daily routine was, and where we guess it deviated. Fun. See anything? Me? Who else would I be asking with a purely mental question? Another figment of your imagination you have failed to bring to my attention? Don't worry, you'll be the first to know. What's the point in having multiple personalities in your head if you can't make them cage by for your own amusement? I'm less than amused. Point me. So, seriously, see anything? I mentally gestured to the map. With an exaggerated sigh, the figment hunched over the map, studying the data points. It'd probably be best to consider what we should be looking for, because right now it's rather obvious he's in this general area. He waved his hand vaguely over the majority of the points. But there's simply too much there for us to really work with, so think. Where would a human obsessed with killing set up his base of operations? Me? Who else could I possibly be talking to? Yourself? You do that a lot. I know for a fact the irony isn't lost on you. No, unfortunately I was asking your opinion on this matter. Why? Consider it my attempt to bring forth more of myself to the surface. Thoughts. Now. Chill. I thought a moment, then focused my attention on the map again. It looked for somewhere to hide. As you said before, the population is too big for him to take on at once, so he needs a lair. Some place he can hide when he's not actively stalking. Preferably somewhere close to where he likes to stalk. Some place to take those he kills. I looked over to see its slightly disgusted features, and clarify what I thought might be the problem. Not that I think he's eating them. 
Maybe I don't know. His food situation or what goes in on his mind, but if nothing else, he needs a place to hide or dispose of the corpses. I drew a square on the map with a gloved finger. Obligingly, it created the box I had outlined. What's inside this area has the least amount of obvious foot traffic? Like, if I were to look at all locations... It started waving to grab my attention. I continued. Contained in this box, is there anywhere that would immediately stand out as having fewer people at all times of the day? Instead of answering, George attempted to pick up my hand that still rested on the map. After letting him struggle for a couple of seconds, I allowed him to resituate my finger, which he deposited approximately one centimeter to the left of where it had previously been resting. Reading the map, I was informed that there was a rather sizable park situated near the very center of my box. Looking up, I was greeted by George's dumb face, smiling smugly. If you just asked me the question first before opening your mouth, I could have pointed that out to you without making you publicly look like an idiot. Eh, they find out sooner or later. Sykes cleared his throat, ending the moment. Might I inquire as to why you wanted to know this? I believe that's where our suspect is. You believe all these disappearances are due to one person? George butted in. Yeah. Wait, what did you think was behind this? Uh, certainly not just one person. Sykes picked up after his partner. All these people lead vastly different lives, and none of them work within the same circle. No one person knows all of them. So? That just points to a serial killer, doesn't it? George chipped in. They're all different species. If it was some sick, purging fucker, then they keep to one type. I mean, that's like one of four or so different reasons I can come up with. Who's to say they just don't like killing? My question was greeted by confused and somewhat disquieted stares. Sykes broke the silence. What kind of sack of shit would just kill for the sake of killing? That's Hunter. He cut himself off. Wait, what's your department called? I winked. Then realising that he couldn't see my face, I waved his question aside. When he continued to stare questioningly, I realised that he really couldn't see my gestures either, so I resigned myself to a cliché. Oh no, not another one. That's on a need-to-know basis. And all you need to know is that I need this area around the park cleared of all personnel, police and civilian, by tonight. And if you got some infrared goggles, I could really use those too. I'm kind of working without some of my department's equipment. We had to rush out here. George appeared stuck in a trance, lost in his own thoughts. But at my tone, Sykes pulled himself together, questions and doubt draining from his features as he drew himself to his full giraffic height. I'll see to it personally. Anything you need as far as gear? How much backup? Do we need air? Drones? Oh shit, I have allies this time? What kind of weapons do your drones have? My question shook his calm, but only for a moment. Um, they're set up to mainly just provide surveillance, but they can be outfitted with crowd control weapons. We could probably tune them up to deal enough damage to incapacitate. The surveillance will be enough then. Keep them high above the park and have them looking for heat signatures. I need some kind of HUD. I assume that can be a part of the goggles? Of course, sighed Sculpt. Will you be needing weapons? How powerful can you make them? Anti-tank? Like, uh... 1A3 Mark II, maybe a 230? His eyes bulged. No! Well, I would be authorised for military weaponry. Just checking, I'm set on weapons then. The goggles con hut should be enough. Sykes turned to George, speaking in a calm but firm voice. You got that? Two pairs of tactical night vision headsets? Oh, just one, I interjected. For me, she won't need one. Got that? Sykes shook the frumpy steelskin shoulder. Brrrr. George returned to us after several painful seconds, his eyes coming to focus. Huh? Headsets? Right, yeah. Headsets. I can get them. One, I reminded quietly, not knowing what was going on but picking up on Sykes' calming tones. One, yeah, one headset, George gulped, then started walking away. Eyeing him for a moment, I gathered I was meant to follow. Signalling for Yalva to stay and hoping I managed to get the point across despite my tarp, George led me through several hallways until we entered a room with several nanofactories. Punching something up, he stood, watching the machine work without seeing it. I stood awkwardly behind him. You gonna ask him why he's all like that? He gestured to George's back. Fuck no. If he's got baggage, I don't want that shit. Agreed. We stood for several slightly torturous moments. Finally, the factory hummed to a stop, and George handed me a melted lump of some plastic-like material. It didn't look like it would fit on anything's head, let alone mine. Right, this shit. I was about to hand the presumably working headset back to George when it twisted my hand, morphing and melting to a pair of human-shaped goggles. Well, I'll be damned. Someone updated the system. Boy, I do not envy the fuck who got Anal Pro to make this possible. Making our way back to Sykes and Yalva, I stashed a headset in one of the many folds of my outfit. 
Have everything? Sykes asked as we approached. Yup, I chirped. One last thing, when we set up the perimeter, it can't be obvious. No lights, no announcements. Just quickly and quietly clear it. Give the park like a free block radius, we can't spook him. And specifics on him are... Simply privileged information, just have all the manpower that you need to make that area clear. When exactly should we start? I glanced at my spectre. Midnight sound good? Does it? Can you think of a reason why it wouldn't? I didn't ask you so you could just shoot it right back at me. Yeah, it sounds good to me, that's why I asked. Wait, actually, he's probably working at night, that's when I'd do it. Try and find isolated targets when it was dark. It motioned for me to share my thoughts with the class. Start a few hours before dawn, I decided, trusting my implant to translate hours into something comparable. Apparently it did it precisely to some other units because Sykes gave a bemused look before registering his understanding. So, he said, we'll meet you there, or... Yeah, actually, can you make it so our ship has clearance to land, say, here? I pointed to a clearing adjacent to the park. We'll come in under cloak, but I don't want traffic control to freak out at us or anything. Sure, he replied. I suppose, but why do you need your ship that close? Call it a hunch. I just think there's a chance we might need it nearby in a pinch. Okay, hold on. You just can't keep us in the dark about everything here. If we're supposed to help you, then we need to know at the very least exactly what we're up against here. We need details. We need... I cut him off. That's the point. I don't want your help. All I need you to do is keep the area clear of civilians and police. If you see something that you think might be our problem, I do not want you to engage. If you see anything that looks threatening, there's only one thing I need from you. Hide. Don't run. There'd be no point. Just hide. Understood? He stared at me, mouth agape. Understood. I asked again, louder. Yeah, yes, uh-huh. He quickly stuttered in acknowledgement. Great. See you there early tomorrow morning. I turned, walking back the way we had come out of ongoing investigations. Three hours before dawn the next morning. Wake up! Up! Mm. My word exploded in pain and bright lights as something hard struck me on the head. My hands flew to protect my head as my feet launched up, aiming at my groggy mind's best approximation of where the assault had originated. Nothing connected, which only made me angrier. I lurched up, hands raised, blood screamed for me to avenge the innocent sleep that had been brutally murdered before my very mind's eye. Seconds later, my vision cleared to see Iava on the other side of my small room. Before you die, I mumble growled, why did you betray me? Oh, fuck off. You told me if you didn't get up by the second prodding, I should just hit you or something. Or something was the key phrase there. I didn't think you'd actually give me a concussion. Oh, did the widow human get a widow bonk on the head? I was out of words, so I just threw my pillow at her and left it at that. Putting on a clean shirt, I headed for the cockpit. You getting any sleep like I told you you probably should, or are you still working off yesterday's fumes? I dozed off for a bit, mucking around in the cockpit. I didn't touch anything you said not to. I think I might get the hang of it. Great. You'll be able to drive once I forget how to, due to my early onset Alzheimer's from too many blows to the head. That's the idea, she piped cheerfully. So, what's the plan of attack? I tried to get my fuzzy thoughts under order. Didn't we go over a plan yesterday? Nope, you just said you'd sleep on it. I didn't think you could plan something while you were sleeping, but maybe this is more magic I'm not aware of. She examined my face for a moment. But now I'm guessing that's just a saying, and you left it, so we'll have to improvise. I shot her a half-hearted finger gun and slumped into the pilot's chair. Fuck, I hate waking up to an adrenaline spike. So long as nothing was lost in translation, then they should be just about done clearing everyone from the area. Not that there should be too many people around at this time, hopefully. Hopefully, she agreed. So how do you plan on finding your guy in a swamp? What? That park, it's a swamp. The majority of the content's ecology is swampy and the park reflects that. I grunted, musing over the new detail as I punched in directions and hit go. You know this how? Like I said, I was mucking around up here. Look some stuff up. I nodded my approval. Before I passed out into what was supposed to be a fulfilling and complete slumber, I was toying with the idea of having him find me. After all, he knows the area far better, so if I'm right and he's in there, then I probably wouldn't have a good chance of finding him if he didn't want me to, even if it wasn't a swamp. So I was hoping of going in there, making a lot of noise, and try to draw him to me. Great. Didn't you say last time you fought him he beat your ass? I really wasn't a good influence on her language. Or I was the best influence. Eh, little of both. Sure. Yep, but I've gotten better since then, I think. More importantly, I have you. You're the main part of the plan here. The ship touched down in the clearing I had some hours before pointed to on a map in a police precinct. 
Lovely, I've always wanted to be a part of a plan where you get to fly around aimlessly doing fuck all while I do all the work. Then have I got the pitch for you? She sighed. So if I understand your implication here correctly, your plan is to just wander in there, thrash her around like an infant for a few hours, hope he gets annoyed and attacks you just to get you to shut up, then when your high-pitched cries of animalistic panic reaches an all-time high, I'll get to sweep in and rescue you. There's a nice way of saying that, you know. Your embellishments aside, yeah, that's the theory right now. We have a few things going for us, though. First and foremost, yeah, we've got you, who can hear better than humans, see in the dark and are small enough to move through cramped spaces quietly. That last bit's why I'm on bait duty. He'll be able to see and hear me easier. Also, I have night vision and drone coverage, so hopefully I won't be surprised by him. Yeah, I think we got this. You always do until things go to shit. Yup, then we'll improvise and save the day. You have any better ideas? She paused, opened her mouth, closed it, then started slotting her various projectile weapons into a harness she had made for them. Nope, let's go get killed. Ladies first, I chimed in, as I threw a recently fabricated cloak over my dual fusion blades on my back. In hindsight, I probably wanted form-fitting clothing going into a swamp, but fuck if I didn't cut a dashing figure in a cloak. That's just your imagination. You look ridiculous. Like I said, dashing. Stepping from the airlock, I breathed in the humid air, sweeping from the leafy wall before me. It was definitely a swamp. A swamp tamed so it fit nicely inside a city, but still a swamp. The walkways blended seemingly with scattered pools of murky water, providing easy access into what would otherwise be impenetrable for those who weren't wearing thigh-high boots. Lowering my voice, I whispered to Iava, who had just hopped up behind me. Keep moving earshot, and move as quietly as you can. She hopped once, then shot silently away, disappearing the moment she entered the tree line. I stood the goggles on and looked at the world with a brand new pair of eyes. The swamp had a much higher ambient heat than I'd been hoping for. Not so much that I wouldn't be able to pick out a body, but it wasn't going to be as easy as I'd hoped. A top-down map was in the corner of my vision, yet it also wasn't going to be as helpful as I'd hoped. Small pockets of heat dotted the park, making it appear almost sparsely populated. Gas, maybe? Well, might as well check them out. Picking the tune, I started to hum. Hand swinging what I hoped looked calmly relaxed by my side, I strolled into the vine-like thicket before me, humming as loud as I could while still trying to appear nonchalant about it. It was already dark before I had entered. The sun not yet up and the street lamps behind me, spaced far enough apart to leave yawning gaps of shadow between them. Once the trees engulfed me, dark took on a whole new meaning. The small window in the corner of my goggles that showed a visible light spectrum was completely black, providing nothing but a blind spot. Had I known how to use these things, I would have just gotten rid of it. As I approached the first small spot of heat I had noticed from the overhead view, that small window of black gained its first speck of light. The heat and the light was in the middle of a muddy pool. Removing my goggles for a second, I saw bright green bioluminescent mushrooms poking out from the surface of the water. They were densely packed in a single clump. From their light, I saw small bubbles simmering around them, confirming that they were expelling gas, allowing the drones above the canopy to see them. They really were quite beautiful. You? Romantic? I'm allowed to appreciate things. I suppose. He sounded doubtful. Even as the mushrooms faded into the darkness behind it, its outline was still visible, hovering in the void. I said the goal was on. Not that I was expecting it to, but it didn't have a heat signature. Picking up whatever I'd been seeing before, I continued on my path heading towards the next small blip of red. What song is that? Huh? You're humming. What song is it? Fuck if I know. I haven't heard good music in decades. I tried to get into the alien shit out here, but it was newsflash alien. Not my jam. The stuff on the kangaroo rat world was a little better, but all they had was flutes and lutes and shit. Everything sounded like a Peruvian pan flute band. Got tired real quick. I was silent for what were some of my most pensive minutes, although that's not a high bar to set. Damn. I haven't thought about Earth in a long time. I don't miss much about it, but if there's one thing, it's the music, and the food, and humans. Not the living, working, or dealing with their shit. Parts of humans, just seeing them. Hearing them talk. Good old-fashioned idioms like beating a dead horse, or I'm not here to fuck spiders. You know. I don't even know if that last one is real. I just heard somewhere that some fox on some continent say it, and it just stuck with me. I mean, I don't even remember which continent it's supposed to be, but I remember the saying. It floated behind me, silent, and yet I knew he was listening. I have no choice. I knew I was talking out loud, but it felt good. Now that I had started, I couldn't stop. You have this weird habit of shifting points of view, you know that, right? You know I used to be an alcoholic? I haven't had a drop since I got zapped up here. 
Well, that was until the kangaroo rat planet. They had booze. But minus that decade and a half or so, nothing. Who knows, but I don't think the courty were what AA had in mind when they said higher power. I fell silent for several minutes once again. We passed another mushroom clump before I broke it. What about you? Me? Yeah, you rational side of me or whatever you are, what do you miss? You don't need to speak out loud. I know, but I'm supposed to be making noise. Now answer me, what do you miss? About... Earth? No shit about Earth. What else would I be talking about? My time in the army? Come on. What would my more rational side miss? Uh... I guess... The air? You don't sound too sure about that. And what? The air? I took a deep breath, trying to summon up memories of the smell of the air of Earth during the stiff spring breeze. Although I think I see your point. Even here in a swamp, the air smells clean. It's humid, but still clean. And dead. Not decaying dead. Just... Dull. Nothing there. We approached another patch of mushrooms. These closed the edge of their respective paw on the side of the path. Squatting down, I reached to pluck one of the mushrooms, wanting to see how long it continued to glow after it was separated from the group. Also, it had helped draw attention to myself. As I plucked at it, the entire clamp came with, their roots surprisingly anchored together. More out of curiosity than anything, I kept pulling with one arm, wondering how long they could hold together. The cluster was almost halfway out of the water when I stumbled back from them with a yell, falling backwards into a pool behind me. Splashing to the surface, I sputtered, wiping water from the goggles that, to their credit, hadn't fallen off. Unfortunately, they had made it hard for me to blink away the image they burned into my retinas. The mushrooms had been growing out what was a waterlogged but unfortunately recognisable decaying corpse. Apparently, Corti really did have spines. Empty sockets had stared back at me from a skull with tattered scraps of skin, slashing off around them like torn drapes. The cluster still stumped around the bank, laying limply there. The hole was glaring at me for disturbing their final rest. Fuck. Oh, fuck. All those heat signatures. Fuck. How has someone not noticed all these yet? Because those that don't have it don't look. They see as well as he does. Empty eyes and empty minds. A chill ran through me as a voice I remembered coming from behind me. Okay, first thing here. Look at the bright side. Of which there were actually several. First and foremost, I was right. Damn, I am good. Second bright side, my plan worked. I had made him come to me by just blundering around a swamp. And thirdly, just off that last sentence, he didn't seem quite as off his rocker as last time. He definitely wasn't all there, but maybe there was just enough that I could actually talk to him this time. Although to what end, I didn't know. Maybe try the don't kill me angle. Sounds good to me. Player two that you. Man, it has been a long time. I slowly started to stand and turn. Last time was what? I didn't get to finish as I felt more than heard his movement behind me. I rolled into the direction I knew he was coming from. My side connected with something, followed quickly by a splash. Stopping myself before I joined him in the pool opposite, I lurched my feet, drawing my blades. Wait, don't turn those on with... Two suns bloomed directly before my eyeballs. I screamed at the searing pain as I dropped the blades and tore the goggles off my face. Cursing, I picked up the two bright blurs on the ground, raised them before me. Something was still splashing, although it sounded like he was moving to the side of the pool opposite from me. Hopefully he hadn't seen what I'd done, because aside from my blades, I couldn't see anything. Fuck, this had better not be permanent. The splashing stopped, and the sound of someone putting themselves out of water filled the air. I waited a moment, and started talking. I had to get him into a conversation, or I'd have no clue where he was. Damn, dude, is there any way to greet a friend? I know it's been a while, but at least you could say hi before trying to kill me again. Silence. Then blessedly he spoke. You are human! His voice was strange, really. I thought it was just more of the voices. They help me, you know. Helps me keep it. They know that if they weren't there, then I'd lose it, but I still have it, and it's stronger than ever. He stopped, waiting for my response. Oh, right, yeah, it. I remember that about you, so, uh, how's it doing? It's stronger, he said in a panting fervour. Stronger than ever before. I've grown it, tempered it, and it's grown bigger. But you, you have it too. You have it still, I can tell. You didn't freeze when I attacked you. You didn't run, you attacked. His voice rose in a nervous giggle, and so he grew into a mad cackle. It only grows a little from these soft things, but you, you'll be worth hundreds of the soft things. You'll make it become so much more. Do sound like he almost orgasmed at the end of his impassioned speech. Unfortunately, he stopped after that. My vision was starting to return, but it wasn't there. I think I saw a blur that was the light of my blades reflecting off his face, but I had to keep stalling. So all these bodies in the swamp, you killed them? Bodies? He sounded offended. These aren't bodies. Only those who have it have bodies. 
These were soft things. Simple soft things. His voice was edging around the pool, inching closer. I could make out the glint of light reflecting off something in his hand. You and I, we have bodies, we have life. Not these, these pulpy bags. I could almost make out his features hidden behind dense and dirty air. All they did was bleat and cry when I called them. None of them had it. If they had, they'd have fought to keep it. It had afforded to keep them. They didn't have bodies, just soft things. A jagged shard of metal came into focus as my vision returned to a workable capacity. His sharp edges were stained with red where they cut his hand, but he seemed not to care. He had edged back to the same side of the pool as me, and now we stood, poised, a few metres between us. Let's dance, fuckface. With an exhilarating cackle, he leapt forward, pouncing in the blink of an eye. He was in my guard and swinging his knife before I could even register. Cursing, I dodged, backpedalling while throwing my blade across my body trying to ward him off. He pushed, keeping it inside my reach, and diving forward with his fist while cutting at one of my hands with his knife. Instead of being cut, I dropped the sword and took his fist to my centre, using it to help push me back while ducking low and swinging up with my leg. He jumped, but I searched forward and upwards, disregarding my remaining blade and shoulder checking him as he came down. In a tangle of limbs, we fell onto the path, rolling as each of us struggled to get on top of the other. A sharp pain pierced my back once, twice, he plunged a knife wally in me, trying to get the upper hand, but I was stronger. Riding the wave of adrenaline, and praying that he didn't hit anything that I couldn't survive without for a few minutes, I straddled him. Seeing his future, he left his knife in me, and struck out at the arm that still held my last sword. A push, a pull, and my numb hand dropped my sword as my arm screamed in pain. I flipped, relieving the pressure, but giving him the opportunity to get on top of me. From there, I knew he'd have me in a hold. I needed an out. One appeared in the form of a Nyalva, flying from the trees. The pressure on my back disappeared as she took him in the chest, throwing him off me. Flipping up right, I jumped to follow her. Getting my bearings, I was just in time to dodge her as he got a hold of her and threw her at my feet. Jumping and wincing sympathetically at the splash I heard behind me, we attacked each other with our fists. Dodge, cut, dodge, dodge, hook, backstep, backstep. He flew at me in a fright of fists and kicks. He was backing me to the water and I knew it. Think. Think. Oh. Taking my last two backstairs, I pulled the knife from my back and attacked, disregarding my already fading body to get to him and force this fight. He went for my arm again, but I had seen it twice before. Twisting away from him, I reversed my grip and plunged the jagged shard into his left thigh. Pulling it out, I jumped it to my other hand and took him the armpit. In a fury, he kicked my feet out from under me. Pulling the knife out as I fell, I used my positioning to pin him in the foot. He howled, kicking my head and my aching back with the other, non skewered limb. The other finally re-entered the fray, throwing herself into the back of his knees. He collapsed, and once again he and I grappled on the ground, both suffering severe blood loss. Iava entered the fight by planting the point of her throwing knife on his throat. You're done, she growled at him. He froze, perfectly still. She looked at me. You okay? No, I winced. You survived getting stabbed multiple times before, you'll be fine. I ignored her. Well, what are you waiting for? Finish it. She said her jaw stubbornly. No. What? Why? For so many reasons, we're not his executioners, he doesn't owe us anything. There's police literally right outside this park, and the families of the people this fuck killed deserve justice. Real justice, not us. I panted tiredly, but if I'd had the energy, I'd have smiled. Okay. How are we getting him out of here? The moment you remove that knife hill, using her tail, she struck him hard in the temple with the butt of a javelin. Fuck! I slumped jumped and instantly regretted it. Careful with shit. You might have just killed him. Wait, seriously? That doesn't just put him out? I mean, maybe, but even that's really bad for him, but... I stuck a finger under his nose. Warm breath brushed against it. Okay, he's alive, but seriously, don't ever do that shit to me. The hair's not just an on-off button. She shrugged. It worked. You stay here and focus on not bleeding to death. I'll get the police and medical assistance. You sure you can find your way back? This place isn't nearly half as complicated as the boroughs have sorted. it. I know exactly where we are. She shot off down the path, calling behind her. Be back, don't die. Yup, I grunted. That's the plan. Fuck, ow. I think I'm just going to take a nap. A ghostly face leaned over to me. No, talk to me. Now that you've seen and talked to a human, do you still want to visit Earth? I laughed, then coughed. Then stopped because everything hurt. That doesn't count. He wasn't human. Not really. He had all the strength and shit, but I don't know. There's more than that and... Oh, yeah, that and that. Hey, what's that? Why is that not all a human is? Why wasn't he a human? It's just not, Kay. He was broken. Will you shut up now? You've called yourself broken. How are you different? I... I don't know. Maybe I'm not. I am broken. I suppose... 
Don't fall asleep when I'm talking to you. How then? How is he different? He didn't try. Fuck. I'm tired, bro. He didn't try to what? Put back... Back together, okay? Damn it, I wish I could slap you. That's actually not the first time I've wished that since my short existence, but hey! He snapped his fingers before my eyes. At least I assumed they weren't actually open. She stood before me, angelic. Her supple curves and soft skin calling invited me closer. I drew near to her, slowly, carefully. She whispered my name, her breath like a summer's kiss. I reached for her. Her chest exploded into blood and viscera as a javelin butt rocketed through her and into my head. Wake up! For the second time that day, I awoke to brain damage and sadness. Yava stood over me, panting heavily in fur, caked in mud, for when she'd been thrown into the swamp water. Better? See? Told you a few stabbings never killed anyone. Head, not an on-off button. Kick me in the chest or something, just stop fucking with my head. If you're going to be a baby about it every time, I just might. Seriously though, how are you feeling? I looked around. It was still dark. The only light came from my discarded blaze and the softly glowing corks. Like I have a hangover without the pleasant memories, but stronger, actually. Wait, you said you were bringing the cops? They're following as best they can. I'll probably have to go back and fire them, but I thought maybe you were pining without me being here. Also without blood, so I got a magic healing kit. Made them show me how to use it and rush back. You able to stand? Yeah, think so. Why? Because it sounds like they actually found us and you don't have your disguise. If you can stand, you can run. I stood, but knew immediately that the only place I'd be leaving this shithole was leisurely. Didn't think I'd need to run as it was anyway. We'll be fine, just let me handle this. I feel better already, she huffed, but she lost the sense that suggested she was ready to dash. We waited in the silence for several seconds before my inferior ears heard a group on the path before us. Several seconds after that, Sykes, leading the group of ten, strode into our little clearing. He saw me, then drove short. What happened? Found your guy, I said, motioning to the unconscious body beside me. He was killing for sport and hiding the bodies in there. All those mushroom clumps in the pools are bodies. Most, anyway. Sykes struggled with what I had said for a moment. And it, he's, a human? You are too? Are all the things I've heard true? I paused dramatically. I don't know what you've heard, but if you want to know what happened, these atrocities were committed by a human, and they were stopped by a human. Walking gingerly, I moved through the group, it parting before me. That line, the atmosphere, it was perfect. Every bone in my body screamed to just keep walking, don't look back. But then I remembered that P2 wasn't actually dead and we had no idea when he'd wake. Thoughts of having to track him down all over again flowed my mind. I looked back. Okay, but actually, yes, humans are weirdly tough. So if you have any painkillers in your medkit that put people to sleep, you should probably give him all of it. Yes, all of it. Then you need to get him into containment. Contact the Corti. They've hopefully figured it out by now, but if they haven't, make sure that he's permanently sedated, because if he wakes up, I don't want to have to come back here and fix this shit up. Oh, and you should probably stop his bleeding unless you want him to die in the next half hour or so. Okay, we clear? Alright, let's get the fuck out of here.